Well, hello, Mrs. Arlovsky here on Riverside Day. I'm in a different room today. Um, I went up into where I do all of my painting. So this is kind of a little bit of a toy room. I also take pictures. So that's hanging on my wall. It's a picture I took. So I do a little photography, just in case you wanted to know a little bit about me. Um, so here I am with dun, da, 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 the one and only Ivan. So I thought we would read one more section before it's officially spring break. So I'm going to start reading from page 118. And we'll see how far we get. And then you can have spring break, enjoy yourself, you know, play outside a little bit. Of course, paying attention to not... You know, being too close to a bunch of other people, so don't go to, you know, a big pool party or anything. Okay, anyway, here we go. The one and only Ivan. When all humans have left, I send Bob to check on Ruby. How is she? I ask as he returns. She is shivering, Bob says. I tried to cover her with hay, and I told her not to worry because you were going to save her. You promised Stella. Bob lowers his head. I wanted to make the kid feel better. I shouldn't have made that promise, Bob. I just wanted... I point to Stella's domain. For a moment, it seems like I've forgotten how to breathe. I wanted to make Stella happy, I guess. But I can't save Ruby. I can't even save myself. I flop onto my back. The cement is always cold. But tonight, it hurts. Bob leaps onto my belly. You are the one and only Ivan, he says. Mighty Silverback. He licks my chin, and he's not even checking for leftovers. Say it, Bob commands. Say it, Ivan. I don't answer. So Bob licks my nose until I can't stand it any longer. I am the one and only Ivan, I mutter. And don't you ever forget it, he says. When I gaze at the food court skylight, the moon Stella loved is shrouded in clouds. Once upon a time, all night Ruby moans and sniffles. I pace my domain. I don't want to fall asleep in case she needs something. Ivan, Bob says gently, get some sleep, please, for your sake and for mine. Bob can't sleep unless he is on my stomach. I hear a stirring. Ivan? Ruby calls. I rush to my window. Ruby, are you all right? I miss Aunt Stella, Ruby sobs, and I miss my mom and my sisters and my aunts and my cousins too. I know, I say, because it's all I can think of. Ruby sniffles. I can't sleep. Do you know any stories the way Aunt Stella did? Not really, I admit. Stories were St Stella's specialty. Tell me a story about when you were little, Ruby pleads. She puts her trunk between the bars. Please, Ivan. I scratch the back of my head. I don't remember things, Ruby, I admit. It's true, Bob says, trying to be helpful. Ivan has a terrible memory. He's the opposite of an elephant. Remember I told you that? This is a little side thing. That elephants had a really good memory. Okay. Ruby lets out a long, shivery breath. Oh, well. That's okay. Night, Ivan and Bob. I listen to Ruby's soft sobs for a long, horrible moments. Then I hear myself saying, once upon a time, there was a gorilla named Ivan. And slowly and deliberately, I try to remember. Now we're on page 123, The Grunt. I was born in a small place humans call Africa, Central Africa, in a dense rainforest so beautiful, no crayons could ever do it justice. Gorillas don't name their newborns right away, the way humans do. We get to know our babies first. We wait to see hints of what they might be. When they saw how much she loved to chase me around the forest, my parents decided my twin's name, Tag. My twin sister's name, Tag. Oh, how I love to play tag with my sister. She was nimble, but when I got too close, she would leap onto my unsuspecting father. Then I would join her, and we would bounce on the tolerant belly until he gave us the 
the grunt. The rooting pig sound that meant enough. That game never got old, although my father might have disagreed. Mud. It didn't take long for my parents to find my name. <clears throat> All day long, every day, I made pictures. I drew on rocks and bark and my poor mother's back. I used the sap from leaves. I used the juice from fruit. But mostly, I used mud. And that is why they called me Mud. To a human, mud might not, like, might not sound like much, but to me, it was everything. Protector. My family, which humans call a troop, was just like any other gorilla family. There were ten of us. My father, the silverback, my mother, and three other adult females, a juvenile male called a blackback, and two other young gorillas. Tag and I were the babies of the group. We squabbled now and then, as families will, but my father knew how to keep us in line with a simple scowl. And for the most part, we were happy to do what we were meant to do, to feed and forage and nap and play. My father was a master at leading us to the ripest fruit for our morning feast and the finest branches for our night nests. He was everything a silverback is meant to be a guide, a teacher, a protector. And nobody could just beat like my father. So I'm going to stop here for a second on page 126 just to talk about that. If you ever seen gorillas and you know they beat on their chest and make noise. So that's what he was talking about there. A perfect life. Gorilla babies and elephant babies and human babies are not so different, except that gorilla gets to spend the day riding on his mother's back, like a cowboy on a horse. It's a pretty great system from the baby's point of view. Slowly, carefully, a young gorilla begins to venture farther and farther away from the safety of his mother's arms. He learns the skills he needs as an adult, how to make a nest of branches, weave them tightly or they will fall apart in the middle of the night, how to beat your chest, Cup your palms to amplify the sound. How to go vining from tree to tree. Don't let go. How to be kind, be strong, be loyal. Growing up gorilla is just like any other kind of growing up. You make mistakes, you play, you learn, you do it all over again. It was, for a while, a perfect life. The end. Page 128, not the end of the book. One day, a still day, when the hot air hummed, the humans came. Vine. After they captured my sister and me, they put us in a cramped, dark crate that smelled of urine and fear. Somehow I knew that in order to live, I had to let my old life die. But my sister could not let go of our home. It held her like a vine stretching across the miles, comforting, strangling, we were still in our crate when she looked at me without seeing, and I knew that the vine had finally snapped. The temporary human. It was Mac who pried open the crate, Mac who bought me, and Mac who raised me like a human baby. I wore diapers. I drank from a bottle. I slept in human beds, sat in human chairs, listened while human words swarmed around me like angry bees. Mac had a wife back then. Helen was quick to laugh, but quick to anger, too, especially when I broke something, which was often. Here is what I broke while I lived with Mac and Helen. One crib, 46 glasses, seven lamps, one couch, three shower curtains, three shower curtain rods, one blender, one TV, one radio, three toes, my own. I broke the blender when I squeezed three tubes of toothpaste and a bottle of glue into it. I broke my toes attempting to swing from a lamp uh, from a lamp fixture on the ceiling. I broke 46 glasses. Well, it turns out there were many ways to break a glass. Every weekend, Mac and Helen took me in their convertible to a fast food restaurant where they ordered me French fries and a strawberry shake. Hmm, sounds good. Mac loved to see the expression on the cashier's face when he drove up and said, Could I have some extra ketchup for my kid? 
I went to baseball games, to a grocery store, to a movie theater, even to a circus. They didn't have a gorilla. I rode a little motorbike and blew out candles on a birthday cake. My life as a human was a glamorous one, although my parents, traditional sorts, would not have approved. So now we're on page 133. My new life as a human. Oh, hunger is the title on the top. Sorry. My new, in my new life as a human, I was well tended. I ate lettuce leaves with Thousand Island dressing and caramel apples and popcorn with butter. My belly ballooned. But hunger, like food, comes in many shapes and colors. At night, lying alone in my poo pajamas, I felt hungry for the skilled touch of a grooming friend, for the cheerful grunts of a play fight, for the easy safety of my nearby troop foraging through the shadows. Remember what happened to Tag? I told myself, don't think about the jungle. Still, sometimes I lay awake wishing for the warmth of another just like me, asleep in a night nest of tender prayer plant leaves. I liked having sips of soda poured into my mouth like a bubbling waterfall, but every now and then I longed to search for a tender stalk of arrowroot to feel the tease of mango just out of reach. Still life. One day, Helen came home with something large and flat wrapped in brown paper. Look what I bought today, she said excitedly as she tore off the paper. A painting to go over the living room couch. Fruit in a bowl, Max said with a shrug. Big deal. This is fine art. It's called a still life, Helen explained, and I think it's lovely. I dashed over to examine the painting, marveling at the colors and shapes. See, said Max's wife, Ivan likes it. Ivan likes to roll up poop and throw it at squirrels, Max said. I couldn't take my eyes off the apples and bananas and grapes in the picture. They look so real, so inviting, so edible. I reached out to touch a grape and Helen slapped my hand. Bad boy, Ivan, don't touch. She jerked her thumb at Mac. Honey, go get a hammer and a nail, would you? While Mac and Helen were busy in the living room, I wandered into the kitchen. A cake covered in thick chocolate frosting sat on the counter. I like cake. Love it, in fact. But it wasn't eating I was thinking about. It was painting. The frosting peaked and dipped like waves on a tiny pond. It looks rich and gooey and dark and smooth. It looked like mud. I scooped up a handful of frosting. I scooped up another. I headed to the refrigerator door. It was the perfect, it was perfect, an empty white waiting canvas. The frosting wasn't easy to work with as jungle mud. It was stickier and of course more tempting to eat. But I kept at it. I scraped off every last bit of that frosting. I may have eaten a little cake too. I don't remember what I was trying to paint, a banana most likely. I suppose I knew I was going to get in trouble. But at that moment, I just didn't care. I wanted to make something, anything, the way I used to. I wanted to be an artist again. So now we're on page 138. Punishment. I soon learned that humans can screech even louder than monkeys. After that, I was never allowed in the kitchen. Babies. Back in those days, the Big Top Mall was smaller. It had a pony ride, a wooden train that bustled around the parking lot, a few bedraggled parrots, and a surly spider monkey. But when Mac brought me the, a baby gorilla dressed in a crisp tuxedo to the mall, everything changed. People came from far and wide to have their pictures taken with me. They brought me blocks and a toy guitar. They held, up, held me in their laps. Once, I even held a baby in mine. She was small and slippery. Bubbles flowed from her lips. She squeezed my fingers. Her rear was puffy with padding. Her legs bowed like bent twigs. I made a face. She made a face. I grunted. She grunted. I was so afraid she would fall that I squeezed her tightly and her mother yanked her away. I wonder if my mother ever worried about dropping us. We always held on, but that's easier to do when your mother is furry. Human babies are an ugly lot, but their eyes are like our baby eyes. Too big for their faces, 
and for the world. Beds. One day, after many weeks of loud talking, Helen packed a bag and slammed the front door and never came back. I don't know why. I never know why of the why of humans. That night, I slept with Mac in his bed. My old nests were woven of leaves and sticks and shaped like a bathtub, cool green cocoons. Mac's bed, like mine, was flat, hot, without sticks or stars. Still, he made sleeping sound, like the rumble of my father used to make when all was well, a sound from deep inside his belly. Page 142, My Place. Mac grew sullen. I grew bigger. I became what I was meant to be, too large for chairs, too strong for hugs, too big for human life. I tried to stay calm, to move with dignity. I did my best to eat daintily, but human ways are hard to learn, especially when you're not a human. When I saw my new domain, I was thrilled, and who wouldn't have been? It had no furniture to break, no glasses to smash, no toilets to drop Max keys into. It even had a tire swing. I was relieved to have my own place. Somehow I didn't realize I'd be here quite so long. Now I drink Pepsi, eat old apples, watch reruns on TV. But many days I forget what I was supposed to be. Am I human? Am I a gorilla? Humans have so many words, more than they truly need. Still, they have no name for what I am. So now we're on page 144. So we'll read a few more, and then we'll be done for today. So we're on page 144. 9,876 days. Ruby is finally asleep. I watch her chest rise and fall. Bob, too, is snoring. But my mind is still racing for perhaps the first time ever I've been remembering. It's an odd story to remember, I have to admit. My story has a strange shape, a stunted beginning, an endless middle. I count all the days I've lived with humans. Gorillas count as well as anyone, although it's not a particularly useful skill to have in the wild. I've forgotten so many things, and yet I always know precisely how many days I've been in my domain. I take one of the magic markers Julia gave me. I make an X, a small one, on my painted jungle wall. I make more Xs and more. I make an X for every day of my life with humans. My marks look a lot like this. So it's just an X. The rest of the night, I mark the days. And when I am done, my wall looks like this. So if you're following along in your book, you know that it looks like a bunch of X's. And so on until there are 9,876 X's marching across my wall like a parade of ugly insects. A visit. It's almost morning when I hear steps. It's Mac. He has a sharp smell. He weaves as he walks. He stands next to my domain. His eyes are red. He is staring out the window at an empty parking lot. Ivan, my man, he mumbles. Ivan. He presses his forehead against the glass. We've been through a lot, you and me. A new beginning. We don't see Mac for two days. When he returns, he doesn't talk about Stella. Mac says he's ang anxious to teach Ruby some tricks. He says the billboard is bringing in more visitors. He says it's time for a new beginning. All afternoon and into the evening, Mac works with Ruby. Ruby's feet are looped with rope so that she cannot run. A heavy chain hangs off her neck. Mac shows her Stella's ball, her pedestal, her stool. He introduces her to Snickers. When Ruby obeys Mac, he gives her a cube of sugar or a bit of dried apple. When she doesn't, he yells and kicks at the sawdust. When George and Julia arrive, Max is still training Ruby. Julia sits on a bench and watches them. She draws a little, but mostly she keeps her eyes on Ruby. Bob watches too. He's hiding in the corner of my domain under not tag. It's raining outside and Bob does not like damp feet. Ruby trudges behind Mac, her head drooping. Endlessly, they circle the ring. Sometimes Mac slaps her flank with his hand. Suddenly, Ruby jerks to a stop. Max pulls the chain hard, and Ruby refuses, but 
But Ruby refuses to move. Come on, Ruby. Mac is almost pleading. What is your problem? She's exhausted, I say to myself. That's the problem. Mac groans. Idiot elephant. Idiot human, Bob mutters. Walk, Ruby, I say, although I know she's too far away to hear me. Do what he says. Walk, Mac commands, now. Ruby doesn't walk. She plops her rump on the sawdust floor. I think maybe she's tired, Julia says. Mac wipes his forehead with the back of his arm. Yeah, I know. We're all tired. He pushes Ruby with the heel of his boot. She ignores him. George looks over from the food court where he's wiping off tables. Mac, he yells. Maybe you should call it a day. I'll close up. Mac yanks on Ruby's chain. She's as anchored as a tree trunk. He pulls harder and falls to his knees. That does it, Mac says. He brushes the sawdust off his jeans. I am through playing around. Mac stomps off to his office. When he returns, he's carrying a long stick. The gleaming hook on its end is almost beautiful, like a silver sliver of moon. It's a claw stick. Mac pokes Ruby with the sharpest point. Not hard, just a touch. I can tell he wants her to see how much it can hurt. I growl low in my throat. Ruby doesn't budge. She is gray, unmoving boulder. She closes her eyes for a moment. I wonder if she might have fallen asleep. I'm warning you, Mac says. He breathes out. He stares at the ceiling. Ruby makes a huffing, so huffing sound. Fine, Mac says. You want to play it that way? He draws back the claw stick. No, Julia cries. I'm going to... I'm not going to hurt her, Max says. I just want to get her attention. Bob snarls. Max swings. The hook slices the air just a few inches away, just a few inches above Ruby's head. See why you don't want to mess with me, Max says. He draws back the claw stick again. Now move. Ruby jerks her head, flinging her trunk toward Mac. She makes a noise that sends the sawdust scattering. It makes my glass shiver. It is the most beautiful mad I've ever heard. Ruby trunk slaps into Mac. I don't see exactly where she strikes him, but somewhere below his stomach. I think I know he must be uncomfortable because Mac drops the claw stick and falls down to the ground and call, curls into a ball and howls like a baby. Direct hit, Bob says. So we'll read a couple more pages and then we'll stop. Poor Mac. So around page 154, Mac groans. He stumbles to his feet and hobbles off toward his office. Ruby watches him leave. I can't read her expression. Is she afraid, relieved, proud? When Mac is gone, George and Julia lead Ruby from the ring. It's okay, baby. It's okay, Julia says, stroking babe Ruby's head. They settle Ruby in her domain and make sure she has fresh water and food. Before long, Ruby's dozing. Dad, Julia asks George, as George locks Ruby's iron door. Do you think Mac would ever hurt Ruby? I don't think so, Jules, George says. At least I hope not. Maybe we could call someone. George scratches his chin. I wish I could help Ruby, but I wouldn't know how. I mean, who would I call? The elephant cops? Besides, George looks down. I need this job, Jules. We need this job. Your mom, the doctor bills... He kisses the top of Julia's head. Back to work. You and me both. Julia sighs and reaches for her backpack. She removes a piece of paper, a bottle of water, and a small metal box. Homework first, George says, wagging his finger. Then you can paint. It's for art class, Julia explains. We're doing watercolors. I'm going to paint Ruby. George smiles. All right, then. Just don't forget your spelling. Dad? Julia asks again, did you see Mac's face when Ruby hit him? George nod. Yes, he says solemnly. I did. He shakes his head. Poor Mac. He turns away, and only then do I hear him laughing. So we're going to stop right there, page 156, and enjoy your spring break, your week off. I will be back with you um, a week from Monday. I'll be back reading some more of this book with you. It's been really fun so far. I hope you're enjoying it and see you soon.